Computer vision algorithms have been demonstrated to achieve high accuracy training uh, by uh, high accuracy results by training to noise. Uh, this undesirable behavior limits our ability to utilize computer vision algorithms in high stake domains such as medical image classification. Uh, therefore, explainability is a key tool to have a better understanding of the underlying logic of models and detect when models are achieving good results by cheating and training to undesirable features. Uh, the work we will review today highlights a counterfactual approach to explaining image classifiers. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Ali Al Sharif, and I'm a steering committee member at Aggregate Intellect. Today, we are hosting Agnieszka uh, Mikowajczyk. Uh, Agnieszka is a PhD student at uh, Gdansk University of Technology, uh, where she is focused on deep learning and uh, explainable AI. Uh, she is the principal investigator in her personal research grant on the subject of bias in data. Uh, currently, she works at Voice Lab AI in the research and development team. Uh, in her free time, she actively engages herself in open source projects, such as uh, running Detect Waste ML for detecting waste in an environment with deep learning. Agnieszka will be presenting her paper, Explainable Classifiers Using Counterfactual Approach, uh, to the audience, please post your questions in the chat, and we will be asking your questions immediately after the presentation. So without further ado, I will now turn the presentation over to Agnieszka. Please take it away. Okay, thank you, Ali, for introducing me. I'm really honored to be here and presenting this work to you. So uh, let's start with introducing our team. So the head of our lab is Michał Grochowski. He is also my supervisor and the other author of the paper, Arkadiusz Kwasigroch. He is also from our team, and uh, the paper I am presenting now will be from those three authors. So I am the presenter, and also two other people from our lab, Maria Ferlin and Zuzanna Klawikowska. We are all together working at Gdańsk University of Technology in the Department of Electrical Engineering, Control Systems, and Informatics. So at first, I would like to tell you a little bit about the background and our motivation towards this study. Then I will move on to explaining the bias in data and briefly about global and local explanations. Finally, I will talk about spectral relevance analysis, the method of global explainability. And then global explanations for bias identifications, the main subject of this, of this presentation. Finally, I will talk about counterfactual approach to measuring bias and conclude my whole presentation. Uh, our experiments were presented on the da data set of skin lesion classification example. This is a very important and also a well-known problem. It was highly popularized by the International Skin Imaging Collaboration called Isaac Ar Archive. They hold annual challenges where uh, people can try to classify skin lesions in benign and malignant, but also in other categories. They gather uh, more data every year, and even last year they presented uh, their challenge on CVPR workshop. One of the example uh, challenges was to classify it into nevus, dermatofibroma, and uh, fa and five different uh, types of uh, skin lesions. Those are available in uh, every year Isaac challenges. However, this data set is not perfect. If you look closely enough, you can notice that a lot of images have black frames around them. There is also uh, a lot of thick and dense hair that sometimes uh, they even block the visibility of skin lesions and also a lot of gel bubbles and other uh, artifacts. And skin lesions are also often of various sizes, but not only, it's really hard to tell uh, where the skin lesion starts and where it ends. And finally, they have large intraclass variation, which means that inside one category, the skin lesions are very different from each other. And on the other hand, they have small interclass variations. So classes together are pretty similar to each other. So I would like to tell you a bit about the paper that inspired us 
uh, to take on this research. It's called the Constructing Bias on Skin Lesion Datasets. It was pre presented on CVPR uh, in 2019. They uh, created a really interesting experiment. They took datasets with skin lesions, and what they did was they covered each image with a segmentation mask, each skin lesion with segmentation mask. Because in ISIC challenges, they also offer segmentation masks uh, of, ski, of, of skin lesions. So they used it to cover the uh, lesions. They created like this an artificial data set, which they used to train the model. So they, they used data set, artificial data set, without any uh, meaningful medical information to train the model to recognize by benign and malignant lesions. Surprisingly, they trained it with, with a success and the loss in accuracy was not very big because at first they achieved around, uh, around 98%, per 88%. And after and after covering lesions with segmentation mask, they achieved 80% of accuracy. But uh, there are some methods in skin lesion classifications that doctors use that uses border of the lesion and asymmetry as a, as a category of classification. So they covered lesions with banding boxes. So not only a skin, but also a big part of the image was hidden behind the banding box. So they trained the model again uh, with even less meaningful information and checked the results. Later, they repeated experiments with banding box that covered 70% of an image. And what they achieved was pretty high results, even though there was no information about the lesions themselves. So they could train the model to classify lesions into malignant and benign without any lesions in the image. Here you can see the result of their experiment. They trained it on two different data sets, actually, on Isaac uh, data set, which I mentioned before, and also on Atlas data set, the other one. So it shows that not only there are similar results for disrupted data sets, but also we can see that this accuracy might be actually a false, falsely high accuracy because we are not sure uh, how the model learned. Their results show that the models can correctly classify skin lesion images without clinically meaningful information. And I think this is the most important thing we can get from this paper. But what is bias in data? When, when the available data is not representative, re, not representative of the population of phenomena of the study, we call it the bias in data. And it's usually unintentional. So for instance, when a, a doctor is taking pictures in, in their clinic, they might have a speci specific instrument to take those images. And for instance, uh, if there is a doctor that works in child pediatry, so he takes pictures only for child, and child usually don't have uh, any malignant uh, lesions. It's very, very rare for child to have uh, benign lesions. So probably when, when he takes pictures only for child and he takes thousands of pictures, he might uh, bring some bias in, the, in data some bias in data set, because our model uh, might learn toward and this uh, toward toward recognizing, for instance, an instrument and not a real benign lesion. So uh, it's usual. So this kind of bias in data is usually when data set was acquired and uh, annotated in some kind of special way. And of course, biased data might lead to biased model. Okay, but we know that we have some bias in this data set because we could train it, it, 
and it overfitted to noise. And we tried it even uh, if we didn't show any kind of lesions to the model. But what actually is causing the bias in skin lesion data set? That was the question we asked ourselves. And uh, they tried to do it with the same approach in the CVPR paper, but with no success. They didn't have any conclusion from that. And how strong is bias in skin lesion data sets? So we started with our experiments. At first, we wanted to try local explainability method, layer-wise relevance propagation. Is, uh, this method is called LRP. And let's uh, quickly uh, explain how it works. So at first, we need to prepare a trained model and instance, so one a single input data and trained model, for instance, DenseNet for classification of skin lesions. And when we have it, we have to calculate predictions for this single instance. When we calculate it, we have to save neurons activations. And larger activations will probably mean that those uh, activations have bigger impact on the final prediction. And actually, LRP method uses this in calculating the relevance score. So what happens, we are using those activations and also the weights of trained model to calculate relevance. And when we calculate it, we backpropagate to the, to the input and achieve an, a relevance map. And the more red, the more red uh, map we can see, it means the stronger uh, influence on the final prediction. Okay, so we generated relevance maps for around 800 malignant images and uh, 8,000 benign. Uh, you can see strong disproportion because uh, usually medical data sets have strong data, uh, data class imbalance. So we also had this problem. And relevance maps were often highlighted meaningless artifacts. Like here, you, we can see dense and thick hair, gel bubbles, and so on. So let's look at close up. Here you can see that relevance map highlighted only, almost only the hair. We even can't hear a skin lesion here. And again, small tiny gel bubbles highlighted by the relevance map. Here we can see again gel bubble and, and her, here, her. So we have maybe a partial uh, answer to the question, what is causing the bias? So probably her, gel bubbles and black frames, but we still are not sure yet because we manually checked some images, but not everything. And so that's when we started to think about global explanations. So local explanations are like the one I showed you before, the LRP method. Local explanations are based on explaining the single prediction, the single input. So we want to know how a single, in, how a single prediction was created. So for a, a famous example of, of this local explanation is, for instance, Lime method SHAP and uh, LRP, Deep Tyler, and so on. And global explanators, on contrary, are when we are explaining how the whole model works in general. So we don't want to explain just one single instance, but we want to know the inner model's workings. And one of the methods of global explanations is spectral relevance analysis, called SPRAY. This was the paper published in 2019 in Nature Communications. Uh, it already have over 200 cita citations. It's a really great paper that, uh, that main idea was to explain numerous local predictions and create a global, average global explanations. So what they do is they create thousands of local predictions and use it to create one average global explanation. And they actually use layer-wise relevance propagation as local explanation. So 
those heat maps I showed you before. And it's actually, uh, this paper is authored by the same authors as the previous paper I showed you before. And they tested in on a Pascal VOC data set. It's a, uh, a quite common data set in e imaging. So let's look at the spray step by step. Let's look at the close up of this part of the scheme. So at first, we need to prepare trained model and data similarly as in the LRP method. So here they propose to prepare first input data for horse and their classifier. Then we need to generate relevance maps with LRP. You already know how LRP works. So here we just have to uh, put input data for the classifier, predict uh, our classes, and then go back propagate to generate relevance maps. When we have those rele relevance maps for this horse prediction, we can go to the next text step. Then they normalize relevance maps. So they resize them and simply normalize from zero to one. And then they run spectral clustering on relevance maps. And they choose the number of clusters with eigenvalues. So what they do here, they get all of the relevance maps and cluster them to find some, some uh, prediction strategies. Finally, they achieved four clusters for the horse prediction. And what was interesting, they discovered that on, in one cluster, there is a lot of images with horse model, with, with horses, where they have a source tag present. So they started to think about it and they tried to remove the tag. When they removed the tag, a pic an image stopped to be classified as a horse. Here on the relevance map, you can see how strongly uh, the source tag is changing the prediction. Also, they placed the tag in the image of an artificial car. And what happened was they started to classify a car as a horse only because, on the, only because of the source tag uh, visible. However, the spray is not perfect. Uh, we noticed some problems with it when we tried to apply it to our data set. Ex explainer actually sees only the some kind of relevance maps, but we don't really know what's on the images, what's under this relevance. So what happens here, it might have some limited applications. It will probably not work on images where orientation of the image does not matter. So for instance, in, uh, in uh, our data set, where we classify skin lesions. In skin lesions, the orientation of the image does not, does not matter. This explainability method might be biased towards the shape of localization of the relevance map. So it's uh, easy to detect with this method source tag, which is always in the same place in the image, but it couldn't probably recognize it if it would be randomly placed on the image because it has no information about input data. Also, spectral clustering run in their method is run on the high dimensionality data and clustering methods are usually not working well with high dimensionality data. Hence, we propo proposed some modifications to make, it, uh, to make it available to use with our data set. Our method is called Global Explanations for Bias Identification, GEBI. And the main idea is to generate global explanations by mimicking the human. So we want to analyze not only the relevance maps, but also associated with it input images. And we want to do it at the same time. So let's look again at, at the close-up. At first, we need to uh, prepare our input data and model, like in the, those two previous methods. 
Then we have to generate predictions for a selected set of data. When we generate it, we have to generate, uh, generate uh, relevance maps. After generating relevance maps, we have to perform some kind of re dimensionality reduction. And in case of spray, they used simple image resizing. In our case, uh, image resizing uh, would be bad in two ways. First way, we would not know how to concatenate image and heat map. And the other thing is that reducing image uh, to the size of 40 per 40 pixels still leaves a very high dimensionality and we lose a lot of detailed information, which is very important in case of skin lesions. So what do we do is dimensionality reduction with isomap and we map each image and each heat map, relevance map into a shorter vector. And what we noticed is was that we get usually better results when our final vector of heat maps is longer than image vector. We concatenate both heat map vector and accompanying image vector into one, and then we cluster those vectors. So we perform spectral clustering on reduced concatenated vectors. So, we achieved four different uh, clusters as well in this case. And what is really interesting is basically cluster third and fourth. But let's look also at the cluster first and second. In cluster first, we can see mostly uh, like very well separated from the skin, skin lesions. On the other hand, in second cluster, we can see not well separated lesions. And here it's uh, almost hard to tell where the skin lesion starts or where it has a border. It's really hard to determine what the, what the real actual shape of the skin lesion is. In, sec in cluster third, we can see that almost all images have black frames around them. And this is really suspicious. In cluster four, we didn't notice it at first, but here you can see small ruler marks made on the skin lesions. And doctors sometimes leave those uh, ruler marks to be able later to tell what size is uh, the, the lesion. Here you can see an animation and each point represents a single instance visualized in a 3D space. So you can actually compare which clusters are and how much are separated from each other. But the most important thing are, is again cluster third and cluster fourth. So we notice that black frames and ruler marks can even generate one, uh, two different clusters. So we started to think that maybe, uh, maybe it might be the cause of bias, those black frames and ruler marks. However, removing artifacts as they did in spray is mm, quite time consuming and it is an, another difficult task. And it also may lead uh, to uh, creating new artifacts instead. For instance, when we use some uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, to remove artifacts and to uh, place uh, an image uh, below, we could create new artifacts. So instead, we propose to insert artifacts and measure how the prediction changed. So we did that. We took all of our images, we placed uh, artifacts on them, and we measured how the prediction changed. And we did that for three types of artifacts. At first, we uh, placed to every image randomly uh, positioned ruler mark. We also placed black frames and red circles. Red circles were an additional test. We wanted to check if those results with red circles will be the same as with black frames 
and through L marks, because if we would get the same results as both of them, it might uh, mean that our model was not really well trained or that this method does not work. So here are the results of our experiments. After placing a black frame to every image, the tra average change in prediction was around 30%. So on average, each prediction changed by a 30%. So it's a quite high score. And additionally, 20% of images changed a prediction from benign to malignant. So we notice that adding a black frame make, uh, makes um, our model uh, predict is more or less malignant. Maximum noticed change in prediction was around 60%. In case of ruler marks, we noticed only a small uh, change in prediction around 2% and maximum change around 20. Red circle well, had similarly around 2% .2 change and around 15 maximum change in prediction. So in this case, the idea behind the counterfa counterfactual bias insertion uh, might mean uh, inserting an artifact on the image and, ch and checking how the prediction changed. So we got two answers to our questions. What is causing bias in skin lesion data set? And here we might answer black frames on the images are causing bias towards malignant because that's what we get. We tested it on over 800 uh, malignant images. And how strong is bias in skin lesion data set? We measured it, how the prediction changed on average, and it was around 30%. We also compared Gabby versus spray method. Uh, it's actually um, really hard to compare those two methods because there is no uh, a single measure that allows us to straightforwardly compare it. So instead, what we did, we create a visualization of attribution maps and images presented on 3D space after clustering them, them with spectral clustering. So here you can see clustering based only on heat maps with image resize. So this is an original spray method. So here we can see that it uh, clustered mostly into two different clusters. And images are very, very mixed on the other hand. And in cluster third and fourth, we have almost only repeating images and the cluster form is even very hard to, uh, to analyze. Here, we clustered based only on images. So in original spray paper, they explained that clustering only on images uh, leaves uh, no very good results and it's a waste of time. So we, tr we tried to do it and our results were similar. Most of the images have been in one same cluster and we have two different non-significant clusters. Then we repeated experiments with clustering based only on heat maps, but with isomap dimensionality reduction. So we didn't here resize the images as in the original spray, but we reduced it with isomap dimensionality reduction. We achieved four different clusters. And here you can see that maybe they are not very well separated, but it looks uh, still a little bit better and it's easier to interpret than the last one. And here, again, clustering based only on input images. And here is an interesting thing because we achieved clusters that were based mostly on the color. So the second cluster seems to be the darkest one. Then we have the fourth cluster. 
and slightly lighter cluster third and the lightest cluster one. Finally, clustering based on both heat maps and input images with isomapping machine learning introduction, so it's a Gabby method. In cluster first, we achieved again uh, light uh, lesions quite well separated. Cluster second, we can see here, uh, here ruler marks. And cluster fourth have almost all images with black frames. As you can see, here images are better separated and also in case of attribution maps, they are very, uh, they have much better groups. So to conclude, we have proposed an improved method of spray, Gabby method, that allows to determine potential biases in data. Then we use different dimensionality reduction method and we use both input and relevance map to generate explanation. We have proposed bias evaluation pipeline by modifying the input, for example, inserting artifact that potentially could cause bias. And we measured how it affected the prediction. Our code is available on GitHub profile. You are welcome to see it, to check it. And our papers, paper is open access. So thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Agnieszka, for, for there's a bit of an echo here. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, I heard, I think, a, the, a little bit of latency. Yeah, I'm not sure where the echo is coming from, but um, we'll, we'll try to work through it. Um, so the um, uh, we're now in the Q and A uh, portion of the session, and um, I will encourage the audience to ask us questions through chat, and we also receive some questions in advance. So uh, maybe we'll start with this question: um, Would it be safe to say that Jimmy is, is model agnostic, post hoc approach? Is that a, is that a fair assessment? Okay, this is a very nice question. Thank you. So. Uh, Actually, it depends. It depends from the local explainability uh, method. If we use LRP as local explainability method, it will not be a model agnostic method because LRP is not uh, agnostic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it would be very interesting to test it on Lime or SHAP, which are model which are a perfect examples of model agnostic uh, methods. If we would use uh, for instance, Lime to generate uh, maps. Of course, different type, uh, kind of maps than in LRP method. Uh, then it would be a model agnostic method. <clears throat> okay. So, so the other parts like clustering are fully agnostic. Okay, so there is a possibility to apply this approach to any more than one underlying explainer. It's essentially, it's, it's a layer on top of uh, an explainer. Yes, exactly. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, now, when I, when I think of uh, counterfactual explanation, I'm, I'm thinking uh, this happened, or this instead of that, right? Um, how? Uh, or if X had not occurred, Y would not have occurred. Help us understand in the context of Jibi, uh, what's counterfactual about it, if you will. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a nice question again. Uh, so in this case, counterfactual uh, means checking uh, bias, inserting and checking the uh, bias. So as I showed you before, I inserted a black frame on the image of skin lesion and I tested how the prediction changed. So what I noticed is that image without a black frame is classified as benign lesion, for instance, and after adding a black frame, it started to be classified as malignant. So this is a, an example of counterfactual reasoning. Okay, so um, does that, I mean, uh, Based on the explanations that you're seeing, uh, is this, I, I mean, we're, we have a nice tool of detecting bias or detecting where the noise is. Uh, 
are you offering any suggestions on um, how to develop better models? Are we just saying uh, hide the black frame, uh, uh, hide the noise, or generate uh, artificial uh, data sets? Um, what, what do you think is uh, a logical approach to uh, develop models that are, that are resistant to noise? OK, so I was actually thinking about it, and I'm uh, working uh, on it now. Okay. I have a few ideas how to deal with the, this. Uh, one of this is um, applying uh, data augmentation. So instead of simple rotation and other linear transformations, we could uh, randomly apply black frame to an image. Yeah. If we would do it randomly, it probably would uh, lose uh, the, the model would not uh, look at this as uh, a bias because it was just randomly placed. So we could randomly place like this as an augmentation, data augmentation method on the image and train it like that. So this kind of bias would lose its meaning. It would not apply only to one class, but to many. And, and this is an experiment that you want to run. You haven't run it yet, though. Yes. Yes, okay. yes, I'm, I'm in progress, <laughs> I would okay, say. Good, good stuff. Now, uh, help me understand the value of isomap dimensionality reduction in your approach. W why is isomap dimensionality reduction helpful or valuable? OK, so uh, the idea of using isomap reduction was to uh, get the smaller dimension dimensionality. So in case of spray, they a resized image to 40 per 40. Uh, so it's still uh, 1,600 points. Uh, we used uh, isomap reduction to lower it to around 30 per uh, heat map and uh, 10 per image. So it was much smaller dimensionality. And in general, clustering algorithm works better with uh, lower dimensions. OK. And, and maybe if you can help us appreciate the value of a global explanation approach versus a local explanation approach? Why is that better? Why is global explanations better at detecting bias, in your, in your opinion? OK, so in our case, uh, the main the main reason to do it that was that we can't actually manually view all of the relevance maps in our data set. There was uh, around uh, around 10,000 of images in total. So manually uh, looking at all of them, checking all of them would be really exhausting. And also it's easy, very easy to overlook some important patterns. So even if I, when I was looking at those uh, images, even when I was checking it out, I, I didn't notice uh, some, uh, some patterns. You know, I, I, I really knew before that black frames are really common, but I never thought that there is more black frames in malignant uh, lesions than in benign. So uh, global explainer, explainer would be useful when we have a lot of instances in our data set, which is actually a common place in deep, <laughs> deep uh, neural networks, <laughs> because all, almost every data set now have a lot of instances. But if we have only 10 instances or so, a local explainer will be enough, I think. Okay, thank you for that uh, clarification. Now, um, you told us that you have your GitHub repo and that it has your experiments. Would you be able to just briefly walk us through what's available in there? And, and share with our audience uh, how yes, they sure. can produce your results? Yes, sure. OK. So uh, our GitHub repo is available on uh, simply typing Gabby. Oh, sorry. Um, here you have uh, a link to a paper and also uh, three steps of explainability. We also explained the steps of detecting the bias. We have also a bias insertion. Mm -hmm. And finally, a notebook to code of Gabby, but also a notebook to code of spray and to modified spray. 
So here we have spray, original spray. Here we have spray with additional isomap dimensionality reduction. And here you have Gabby, so uh, concatenating heat maps with uh, images. But also what's important, uh, we added to our repository uh, images uh, of all skin lesions. So here you have uh, benign heat maps and also malignant heat maps. So you don't have to do uh, any LRP uh, method on your own. You can test our algorithm on the example of skin lesion uh, just using this re repository. And here you have Gabby notebook. It's pretty easy to use. You only just have to uh, type how many clusters you want to uh, you want to select. We selected our number of clusters with um, elbow method. You can try this also. Uh, and you can, as I showed you before, visualize uh, images in a 3D space and analyze the results. Yeah. And, and also, this is, yeah, go ahead. Yes. So no, no, please, please go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, please, please go ahead. I'm sorry. OK, we also added uh, three uh, different uh, notebooks with uh, adding bias to images, uh, how we added frame and ruler marks and other, and also a script to generate nice, uh, cool 3D visualizations. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so th technically, somebody should be able to bring in their own data set and follow your approach step by step and potentially uh, generate their own version of an explainer and, and, and extend your work. Yes, exactly. However, we did not attach um, code to LRP, but it's uh, widely available online. We already used uh, implementation from a different repository. So I think somewhere here, it's a link to this implementation also. OK, beautiful. Beautiful. Well, th thank you. Um, that is uh, extremely helpful. And uh, uh, Agnieszka, before we, uh, I'm just looking here. It looks like we're um, uh, done with our questions here. Before we wrap up, are there any final thoughts that you would like to uh, share with us? And last thoughts. Mm, test your models, because you might have full security. <laughs> <laughs> okay, words of wisdom. Thank you. Agnieszka, I, I thank you for a great presentation. And we thank all of those who joined us online and submitted questions in advance. To see more free content like this, uh, please visit our website at ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at ML Papers Explained to get notified about uh, all the live sessions and free content we publish. Uh, this concludes our event. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Okay. Good. Yeah, I think we might still be live. We'll just uh, give it a minute to finish <laughs> okay. it. Right, to...